Well, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. And, um, we'll be in the book of Ephesians, if you want to work your way over there, um, chapter 6. Uh, we're going to be going over a portion of scripture that is well trodden, um, and you're probably well versed on, um, and I just, it's, it's something that for me, I, I think about constantly now, a lot more than I used to. And so we're going over this, and it's, um, it's going to be, you know, Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18. And why 18, not 17? I don't know. Because sometimes these chunks in the scriptures really weren't made to be split up, like, real conveniently. And it's kind of like when you go and you buy that really fresh pizza, and you open up the box, and you go, oh, I want this slice. And you start to pull that slice out, and then, like, all these other pieces of cheese start pulling off of the uh, surrounding pieces. And you're like, well, okay, I guess I get a little bit more of this, right? It's, it's kind of the same thing when you're trying to divide up scriptures for, for when you're trying to preach in a section. You're like, where do I cut this off? I'm like, nah, I'm just going to keep pulling and see what else just sloths off with it. So, and it's all good. That's, that's the great part. Um, so we're doing um, Ephesians 10 uh, through 18, and <clears throat> I'll read that for you right now. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of truth, which is the word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. So you see how it's kind of like, that's the cheese part that is because pulled off a couple of the other slices. Any thoughts as to why this has been on my mind as of late? Like, let's say the last two and a half years. <laughs> oh, that's right. It's because of a career change. You know, it, as a... I don't want to get in the head of myself. I probably will. I'm totally screwed this up. That's fine. But I wanted to start off with this question. And it's a very, and I mean this to be a very personal, very direct question for you to think about in your hearts and to ponder and to, you know, continue to think about it as you leave today. And that is simply the armor of God. Why do you need it? It's a war. It's a war, yes. Decay. You didn't listen to the instructions. <laughs> You're supposed to ponder this question. <laughs> Your ability to you know, to follow instructions and take as part of this examination. Them kids, but <clears throat> cop joke. Um, so the question is, why do you need it? And the real deeper question that is more pointed is, do you need it? And this comes back to this question of, what is reality? What is real to you? And what is your perception of reality? And does your perception of reality actually match reality? And I'm not one to be, you know, oh, there's a demon behind every bush kind of a person. But at the same time, I really want you to think about, is there an enemy in this present age? 
what is their goal, or his goal, or its goal, however you want to put it, is it simply satisfied, satisfied in loathing you? Is it simply satisfied in just lo loathing you? To despise or hate you? Or does this enemy actually possess the characteristic of malice? Anyone here familiar? Okay, again, time out. This is going to be flooded with cop stuff now. I hate to say it, but I have become a changed person. <laughs> it happened. I, I didn't want it to happen, but it happened. So now cop stuff is just going to be flooding my life. It's going to be permeating a lot of my illustrations. If you get bored of it, throw something at me, but don't hit me because that's 242 and you'll be in trouble. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so is, is anyone familiar with the name Christopher Michael Staub? Anyone familiar with that name? No? No. Okay. That's fine. You don't have to be. Actually, I'm kind of glad you're not. Um, but I'll tell you, that name is one of the names that changed my life forever. Because on the morning of September 9th, uh, it was September 20th, um, 2020, at about 10, 20 hours, I was... Just doing my patrol. Little sleepy city of Grover Beach. The morning had just kind of thawed out. You know, people were starting to move around, get up and do their coffee run and walking their dog. And I was being dispatched to a rather annoying call, um, which could always, you never knew how it was going to go. There was um, a mother who had a son who was the, um, mentally disabled. And she was his payee, which means that she controlled all of his money. But he was mentally disabled to a degree where he would have violent outbursts. So somehow she was able to get a restraining order from him from her property. But he had to come to her to get money because she had his money. So it was this weird dynamic where we were like, what? Okay, someone missed something somewhere. And so sometimes she would let him in and feed him if he was being nice. But once she started to think that he wasn't being nice, she couldn't mom up. So she made us come and be mom for her. And we'd have to go. It was a terrible situation. It finally got resolved. Anyway, so I was on my way to that call. I'm like, oh, what's going to happen here? Blah, 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 driving down the street. And suddenly the radio just explodes. Shots fired, shots fired, I'm hit, subject is running westbound, I, you know, I'm bleeding, I can't walk. I'm like, oh my word. And there was a deputy on the other end of the line just screaming for his life. And just that cold chill went down the back of my spine. And I just sat there and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And so I'm like, my call can wait. And I'm listening. Am I going to get dispatched out? I mean, this is kind of priority traffic. What's going on? And then I start to start to figure out where this they're at. They're up in Templeton. And I'm like, oh, I know exactly where that's at. And suddenly I start hearing people responding. Go three, go three. All these people start to show up. Blah blah blah. blah. More shots fired. I'm like, this just went. This morning just went insane. And I'm hearing the deputy saying, Can someone come out to me? I can't walk. I'm pretty sure my leg is broken. And it's like, and I mean, he wasn't, to his credit, he wasn't like screaming. Ah! He was like, but he's just like, hey, I'm kind of bleeding here. I need someone to get to my car to help me. He's pleading for help. They're still trying to find this guy. Huge gun battle ensues. Turns out this guy, he was a white supremacist. Convicted felon, wanted felon, shot the deputy, and the deputy tried to con um, confront him. Guy ends up circling back to his car with a cache of weapons. He's trying to, he's shot all the rounds out of his gun indiscriminately. Some of them went through my, one of my friend's um, garages. He's sitting out there working his garage. Bullets just start coming through. And he's like, what just happened? 
and him and his son like laying on the ground trying to get underneath the, anything that's going to give them cover. And this guy is he's just putting off right. He doesn't care. Doesn't care. Because this is a person, when you start to look at his history and who he is, he wasn't just happy to sit back and hate people and despise people. He had a strong intent for malice. He was a person who wanted to hurt people. That's why he carried a gun was to hurt people, and namely law enforcement. Because he knew that one day there would be this confrontation, because he was wanted. And he knew he was wanted, and he's out and about going, yeah, I'm wanted, what about it? And then the day came. He ended up dying outside of his car where they found a load of guns. So, do we have an enemy that is content to hate, or does he possess malice? Any people here spend much time in the book of Job? Not really. It's, it's not one you generally turn to. Some curious things about the book of Job. It's actually thought to be the oldest um, book in your Bible, right? Thought to be the oldest one. It's a curious story. I, I, I don't mean story. It's a curious account. Because it's one of the, those rare times when the veil of, of what we can perceive is lifted. Kind of like when John was able to see in the book of Revelation. What is going on in the heavenly realms that we don't have access to with our earthly bound eyes? And the book of Job has this characteristic where the veil is lifted. You know, I kind of always think about the Wizard of Oz. You know, don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain kind of thing. But it's like the curtain's removed and you get to peek back there. Hey, what's going on out back here? And it starts off this way. Um, you know, first you have, there was a man in the land of Uz. Now we're really starting to make that connection with the Wizard of Oz, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> there was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job. And the man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. And as you keep reading, he was very blessed. And he knew it. And he worshipped God for it. Verse 6. Now, there was a day... When the sons of God came to present themselves before Yahweh. And I love this. When you read in your Old Testament and you see the capital L-O-R-D, that's God's name in there. So think about that, Yahweh. And then as I was writing this, I really got caught and caught up in the names of God. Because there's, there's just there's such a richness in the names of the Lord. So uh, you know, this is... God the Father, Yahweh, El Shaddai, which is God Almighty, Elion, the Most High God, and then one of my favorite you know, the, my favorite titles for God, El, I think, Roi, which is the God who sees me. And that was given to him by Hagar when God saved her in the wilderness after Abraham and Sarah turned her out. And he brought her water and she said, you are the God who sees me. It's amazing. Amazing. Anyway, so the sons of God come to present themselves to him. Not really quite sure what that means. You know, just like, I mean, think about it. When was the last time you went and presented yourself before somebody? I could think of one scenario that I think we've all had um, that we all have something in common, and that's you've been called into your boss's office. Right? I think that's kind of what's going on here. 
You know, it's not like they're coming to you know, like, oh look, here we're giving you our cool, this cool stuff. It's like they're coming to give an account of themselves. It's like they're coming to present, they're coming to the boss's office, and it says that sons of God can present themselves before Yahweh, and Satan or the accuser also came. He was also summoned. He also had to come and present himself. And it says, And Yahweh said to the accuser, or Satan, From whence dost thou comest? Okay. Or from where do you come? Sometimes I think translators have never been in trouble in their life. Because, you know, it's like, From where do you come? It's like, oh, from here and there. It's like, that, that. No. Let's get an actual real reading into what that means. Where have you been? Because then you start reading like, well, where have you come? It's like people, you know, commentators get really in, they get so caught up on that. And they go like, well, God knew where they were coming because in his, you know, in his all-knowing ability, he, he, he wanted to, he asked that question so the other angels would know where, where Satan has been. It's like, because it's going to be such a mystery. No, God's saying, where have you been? You know, I'm coming back from a late night. You know, mom and dad are waiting up for you. Like, oh dear. You know, give an account of yourself. And what is Satan's response? From roaming about the earth and walking around it. So, is this like the biblical version of walk and turn? You know, like... One, two, three, four, nine. One, two, three, four. It's like, no! It's like, what is God? What, what's the response here? What God's saying, where have you been? And Satan's response is, I've been hunting. I've been hunting. That's what I've been doing. I mean, it's, think about this. In, I mean, if you want to see someone that's just like, the absolute arrogance in, of Satan when he just sit there is like, well, I'll tell you what I've been doing. I've been going through your creation. I've been trying to find something. I've been hunting for him. And that's when God says, have you considered my servant Job? It's like, okay. You want a challenge? I'll give you a challenge. You've been hunting, picking off the low-hanging fruit? Let me t I'll give you access to the best. And I will show you the quality of my love for these people and their love for me and their understanding of their dependence upon me. And then you have the rest of the book. It's a powerful read. But it definitely illustrates at the very beginning that there is an enemy who's solely bent and consumed with malice. Peter also puts it this way in 1 Peter 5 8 Satan prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Like a roaring lion, fierce, hungry. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard a lion roar in person. We were at the San Diego um, Wild Animal Park. And for some odd reason, the lions just got to burn themselves and they wanted to start roaring. And it was powerful. It's kind of like letting everyone know on the block, hey, I'm here. And that's the way Satan goes about his business. So, go back to the original question. Do you need the armor of God? What do you believe? And I want you to take seriously and consider well the shipwrecked lives of people such as Marty Sampson, Joshua Harris, Pastor Carl Lentz, if you don't if not familiar with many of these people, the first one, Marty Sim, uh, Sampson, was one of the worship leaders, songwriters for the Hillsong Church. 
very prominent in that sphere. Then he wrote an upended piece saying, basically, I'm walking away. I don't know your feelings about Joshua Harris. He was a Christian author, very prominent in the mid to late 90s, early 2000s. Wrote a book I love to hate called I Kiss Dating Goodbye. So stupid. Can you imagine being like a 16, 18 year old boy and you're just like, the only thing you want to do is find a nice girl who loves Jesus so you want to take her out on a date? Because I just read this book, I kissed dating goodbye, it's not going to happen. Like, <laughs> Great! I'll go watch Star Wars. <laughs> and I did. But Joshua Harris walked away from the faith for the love of this present world and its riches. And then, of course, there's the much defamed pastor from the New York um, Hillsong Church. And that's Carl Lentz. Rubbed elbows with the rich and famous. Seemed to get caught up in that scene. And <clears throat> his committed adultery. And we're talking about it today in this little tiny corner of the world. 3,000 miles away. Because it did, it had an impact. It did. You know, this was the guy who, didn't he baptize Justin Bieber? Something along those lines? Wrong crap. Yeah. It's like, oh, wrong crap. Well, you guys don't do Justin Bieber. No. <laughs> but with all, these, with all these people who were prominent within, you know, as prominent as Christians can be, right? Prominent members, publicly seen and noticed. For all, of them, for all of them, the story of their downfall seemingly is very similar. It began with thoughts. Thoughts led to exceptions, either morally or you know, socially. Whatever their minds were going down, they started to allow certain exceptions for things before they knew it. They took a stop, looked at them, and said, like, oh, yeah, I don't actually believe in God anymore. Interesting. It's kind of like, you know, you put a frog in warm water and it's kind of like start to boil and before they know the frog dies, he won't leap out. But if you take a frog and you throw him in like really cold water, he's like, ah! Or really hot water, he's like, no. It's like, but this slow process before they know it, they're gone. <clears throat> so, going back to where we started. Ephesians. Starts off, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. I love that Paul starts us off with this mindset. And a lot of this is going to be mindset, okay? A lot of this is going to be how you're going to prepare yourself mentally to get all this done, to get that armor on. I can't tell you enough how every morning when I, or whenever I start my shift, when I go, I go into my locker room, I have this routine. It's a very simple routine, and my mindset changes as it starts off, as I'm taking off my shoes, I have my arms up, and I reach in, and I pull out my body armor. And I take that vest, I pull the Velcro back, and I slide that shell over my body, and I put it down, I get it tight, I make sure that my folds on the front go around the folds on the back, so that way when the bullet comes, it hits and goes around. It doesn't go get caught and go into my sides, it goes around. You see what's already happening? My mind is getting prepared to get shot. Because I'm putting this thing on for a reason. It's there to stop something. And I'm getting it, and now I'm getting it tight, I'm pulling it down so it's nice, and it's up against my body, all my vitals are covered, okay? I'm ready for the next step. I get the radio piece, I put it in my ear. 
this is vital. I need to be able to hear. Make sure. Is there any is there anything inside this? Any any moisture? Anything that's going to block radio traffic suddenly when I don't have the opportunity? You know, it's like because when Murphy's law, when it happens, it's going to happen, and it's going you're going to be left out in the cold. It's like okay, no, everything's good. Clear communication. I got in. I'm ready to go. Right. The mental preparedness. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. It's this mental exercise that you need to go through that says, okay, I'm not going to be able to do this on my own. I need to be practicing what I would call from John, from the Gospel of John, the abiding life. This is a great time to read this, this short scripture for you. John 15, I am, Jesus saying this to his disciples in the upper room, I am the vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that may be, um, so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And that phrase, abide in me, I... I heard this, and it's the best definition. It means to be constantly connected and desperately dependent upon Jesus Christ, your Lord. And Paul starts off saying, you want to put on the full armor of God? It's going to, it has step one. You need to be in God. You need to depend upon Him and His strength. And then verse 11. I love this. Put on the helmet, and walk out the door. Does it say that? No. Put on the full armor of God. Put on all of it. It's amazing when you look at, you know, I wish I would have brought my gear with me just so I could show it to you. Because that would have been fun. But at the same time, it's like, I didn't know. I was like, hey, look, this is my gun! He's like, oh! <laughs> um, you know, but it's like, when you go and you put on, it's like, you're not just limited to the body armor, right? Like I said, you, you got the body armor, you put that on. Then you have, you know, or, you know, you've got your belt. Then you've got your duty belt. On your duty belt, you've got your handcuffs, which you have to make sure you take your handcuffs out because I live in a salty, or work in a salty area, and there's nothing more terrifying than going, you've got this felon who's fighting, you've got his arms, you're trying to put on the handcuffs, and they're rusted. <laughs> <laughs> and no, it's not for lack of use. It's because sometime when they sit for three or four days in your locker, when you get off, when you come back in your next shift, they'll start to seize. So you have to make sure, you start off every shift, get them spray a little bit, work them, work them, work them, clean them, work them, work them, work them. So that when you go out there, click, click, done. <laughs> you, come on, buddy. You know, so you know, you've got your handcuffs, you've got your tourniquet, very important. And the tourniquet has to be able to be reached from both hands. From the tourniquet, you've got your sidearm, from the sidearm, you've got your mace, then you've got your radio, and then you've got your baton, and then uh, you've got your um, magazines right here. And, you know, yeah, don't forget your taser, because that works. You know, so you've got that. On your duty belt, now, all that hanging right here. Then you got you know, vest, radio is very important, like I said. Then you go to your car. What's in your car? Oh man, you got the 40 millimeter. Then you have everything else, hazmat kit, you know, all this stuff. It's like when you, before you go out on patrol, there's a huge checklist of everything that you need to make sure that you got, so that you're ready. And you need all of it, all of it. You've got folders full of forms, and you need all of them. And when you go out in your daily life, you need the full armor of God. Don't leave anything behind. And, you know, you've got the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the sandals of the preparation of the good news of the gospel. 
The shield of faith. I love when you read about the shield of faith. What's the shield of faith able to do? Block some of the stuff you're going to fall in. No. Block all. Extinguish all the fiery, fiery arrows. Take a water. The helmet of salvation. And finally, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. All of those things. You need them all. I'm not going to go, <laughs> it's five minutes left, I'm not going to go through all of the, the parts of the armor of God. I think that would be a wonderful study for you. There are literally books and books out there, and it would be a great thing to do, um, a great study, a great time to sit and just reflect upon the armor of God. To prepare yourself for spiritual battle. And what are these things? So, again, it would be a great study. Um, do it on your own time. Um, it would be time well spent. Um, but what I can tell you is, is that we are involved in a desperate battle. We truly are involved in a desperate battle. And it's a daily battle. It's a moment by moment battle. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. You never know when, some, well, sometimes you'll see the battle coming. Sometimes you will. Like when Joel got diagnosed with cancer. Like We didn't know he was going to get diagnosed with cancer, but he had the discomfort. He had all this stuff. Okay, so we know something's building up. And then, oh, here's the diagnosis. We're in for a long haul. This is going to be a fight. And we pray with Joel for cancer, right? Still going. Battle's still going. Still praying. Still fighting. So sometimes you can see that kind of a battle building up. You know, parents getting old and needing care, starting to pass away. You can see that battle. You know it's coming. Then sometimes the battle just blindsides you and you get ambushed. And you may lose a couple steps in the initial onslaught. But did you bring the tools with you to resist and continue to fight back? Cop story. Another nice weekend warning. Rather early. Only been on shift for about an hour. Got done with the briefing. Went and got my little coffee, you know, smiled, shook hands with some of the folks around the city. Just, you know, doing, just doing what you do. Community for policing, right? Make sure you say hi. We got a memo. Your cops don't smile and wave enough. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So make sure you stop and wave enough and get up. And it's also, and you're like, there's a point. It's like, I made it a point now, um, since I'm working weekends, it's fabulous. I get to get out and I go to every um, yard sale I see. <laughs> it's great. I'm like, now I've got $50 just burning a hole in my pocket as I'm going around from yard sale to yard sale. But it's fun to get there and go and say hi to people. Do a little meet and greet. And you never know what people show up to these yard sales. Because then they'll turn around like, oh, I'm like, ha, ha, ha. I know it. Let's go talk. You know? <laughs> but so it was just a nice calm morning. And again, that radio just blows up. And I'm listening, and this call's coming out from Pismo, which is our neighbor jurisdiction. Someone's getting strangled. Um person's in the process of being strangled, 
they're down some serious bodies. They need code three, which is like lights, siren, pedal to the metal, backup from me and my partner. And it's like, drop the coffee. Let's go. And of course, it's a neighboring jurisdiction. I don't know where they're at. It's like, what street are they on? All right, so cops can drive really fast. There's people walking the street, so you have to drive with safety. You got this. That's why the sirens are on to let people know, like, hey, there's a very um, what's 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 the good word to to think about. Um, there's a, there's a person driving a car at a very high rate of speed that's really not paying attention as good as they could to all the surrounding things because we have this computer that's telling us what's going on and then we have a map finder that's telling us where we need to go and we're driving really fast and then we have a radio that we're trying to talk to and communicate telling people where we're going and how we're getting there and then you're getting all this information so it's a little bit of distracted driving. Just... <laughs> I show up on scene grab, you know, we'll grab a gun, you know, big shotgun, go running out, and they're like, guys in here, bunch of unsecured handguns and rifles, um, just try to kill these people, mental health issues. It's like, oh, okay, well, I'll be right back. Run back down, helmet, active shooter vests, now I've got a lot of armor, I've got a shield, I have a shield, I grab more stuff, and then we stood like, but we had all the tools, both my partner and I, we had, it, we had all these cool toys. We had all these tools that were going to help us to get this to a peaceful resolution, right? But we were, and that ended up being an eight-hour deal. So it's like you never know when that call is going to come out, which is why I'm stressing to you that there is a reality Maybe that doesn't quite fit up with your perceptions. But there is a spiritual reality and there is an enemy who is filled with malicious intent to do you harm. And you're not going to see it. And the way how they get victory is they're going to sap joy out of your life. They're going to destroy relationships that you have. They're going to do everything they can to bring you down. Not just like the financial ruin and, you know, personal disaster that Job felt when all of his kids died and his house was broken down to the ground and he was sitting on the pot of ashes. And then his friends bailed on him, which is pretty good. But I think even his wife kind of turned on him a little bit. You know, curse God and die kind of thing. Uh, rough, rough day for Job. You know, rough times. Um, but, I mean, when I, sat, I sat down to write this, this sermon and... It was a battle to get this sermon off the ground. And I'm in the middle of this going like, wow, we're under spiritual attack right now. Thankfully, my wife was a little bit more prepared spiritually for that battle than me, and she was able to pull me out of it. And that's another point, is in your relationship and your marriages. Do spiritual battle together. It's going to happen. And of course, since I brought it up this morning, it's going to happen today. So with that, let me pray for you with one of my favorite prayers. Um, and ask for the Lord's blessing upon you. As you go forward, do battle every day. You know, it starts prayerfully standing in the power of God and go through that checklist as you're putting on each piece, knowing what it's for. It's always a surreal moment. I love going to trainings. I love going to range and shooting. It's a lot of fun until it hits you. Like I went to an FBI um, crisis negotiation course, which was really cool. I got this. I got an actual shirt that says FBI crisis negotiator. Right? I'm like, that's an FBI seal. That's cool. You know, in the back of my mind, I was like, maybe these guys are going to recruit me because they're like, hey, you're a really good negotiator. You can talk great. Why don't you come and be in the FBI? Forget that small, you know, great 
department you work for. <laughs> and so uh, that of course that didn't happen. That that's just those fanciful dreams can dream like. Um, good song. Uh, so um, where was I going with that? <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> Uh, Christ the Negotiator, yeah. It was a really fun course. I really had a great time. Um, got a lot of really good skills. And then it hits you. It's like, why am I taking these skills? It's because one of these days, I'm going to be caught um, with somebody who has either done something terrible has affected a lot of people's lives forever. And I need to have the ability to talk with them to prevent them from doing more terrible deeds. When you read about the armor of God, it's there for a reason. It's to keep you intact with your Lord, to build you up, and to protect you because you have need of protection. So, For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth? And to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever.